Hi folks, I'm International Master John Watson, and this is Ask the Master on ICC-TV. The main idea of this show is to provide you, the players and listeners, with a forum to ask questions about chess and the chess world. And I'm going to just pop over to the screen and see, okay, there are people on, and I want to be sure that I'm streaming properly here so that I'm not talking to the wind. There we go, a few people up there. Um, okay, so the idea is that you can ask questions about chess in the chess world. There's a chat window on your right in YouTube if you're watching this live. Otherwise, you can watch all of these shows archived going back a couple of years on YouTube. Uh, if you just Google Watson and Ask the Master or something like that. And um, we, uh, those, the chat to the right, you can ask questions in. And the other way to ask questions, which I actually prefer or is, is in a way more... Uh, more convenient and more uh, detailed, or it gives you a chance to be more accurate, is um, to submit the question in advance by email. And the best way to do that is askiamwatson at chessclub.com. That's an email address. I'll slow down and do that again. Askiamwatson at chessclub.com. A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at C-H-E-S-S-C-L-U-B dot C-O-M. So, and you can also send a message to my ICC handle if you're an ICC member, that's the Internet Chess Club, uh, John L. Watson, J-O-H-N-L-W-A-T-S-O-N. And of course, being an Internet Chess Club member is a great thing, and it's going to be wonderful for your chess. It's got the best players in the world playing on it, and also tons of extra shows and broadcasts and things of that sort for your chess education. Um, so as I say, the alternative is to ask a question right now. The question, the topics we tend to cover uh, are openings. Uh, people love chess openings. They ask a lot of questions about chess openings. I've got one this uh, week on chess history, which uh, is a big favorite of mine, chess history and chess books. Uh, so you can talk about those, any books you've been reading, or any opinions you have about chess history. It doesn't have to be even a question. It can be something you just want to bring up on the show and we can talk about. Uh, we talk about strategy. We talk about improvement. We talk about uh, the best players, the recent events, things like that. Anything that comes to your mind about the chess world. Uh, my stream is freezing. I hope you guys isn't. Let me redo that and hope for the best. You might want to tell me if you're having trouble on the chat. Webcam froze, yeah, yeah. We had a, an interesting error message pop up, and we were hoping we could go by without it. Uh, can you still listen to me? I, the last thing I got on the chat is um, frozen. You frozen and frozen. I may have to just start the broadcast again. <laughs> All right. So, folks, so I'm still frozen, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then let me um, let me just log out of here for a second. Let me close down the stream and start it again. So let me just try that. And hope. Oh, there it goes. It says you're now live streaming. Okay. So I'll get ready to turn the sound off when you tell me. No, but I can hear, I can hear, unfortunately, anything I'm saying on the, yeah, so it, and it's really kind of irritating, even if it's at a very low volume, so. Oops, I'm hearing the delayed <laughs> broadcast now. Should I start? Hi, folks. I guess uh, that was me talking to my producer, if you heard that. Uh, why don't you give me a, a message if I'm back on? I think uh, Forever Young, absolutely. Forever Gray. Forever Gray is better than Forever Dead, right? Um, yeah, here we go. It's restarting the stream. So that seemed to be working, but I'm not getting it. So could you guys uh, say something like, is uh, if you... If, you, if the stream is still frozen. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, okay, that's what I suspected. But you can hear me, oddly enough. So somehow it's just the video stream. Uh, this really 
probably this show probably won't work too well without moves. Um, although we can do it, we can try it. But I think before that, I'm going to try to reset everything uh, from the beginning. So expect about a five minute delay here. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to reboot the computer completely, and that takes a little while. So if you can wait for about five minutes, I should be right back on. Okay, thanks everybody, and I'll see you in a second. You are now streaming, it says. Oh, you've already said, you've already verified it? Or, oh, okay. Okay, folks, I guess it means people are listening, right? Uh, tell me if you're getting this. We're back. Uh, it was uh, some Windows problem. So that uh, I'll have to send a bill, to, a bill to Bill Gates, I guess, about that and get my money back. Um, let's hope this is working. There's one way for me to check that. Let me check my stream. There we go. Ah, okay, I'm getting something. Okay, well, that was quite a delay. Um, might as well just get going with the questions that I was sent then, uh, and then we'll also get anything that we've got on the, um, on the chat. Doesn't look like there's anything on the chat yet. This is, these are interesting comments about inflation. This is quite true. There are there are difficulties with uh, with that rating system. I agree. I'm just looking really fast. Hi everybody! Wow, look at all these people. Hi Rich. And here's the I'm now I'm down to the frozen frozen thing. Hopefully a lot of you have still stuck around. I hope you didn't just give up. Uh, looks like it's working now. Can anyone tell me if there's a part two in Jeremy's new book on how to reach your chess? How to reach your chess. Um, <clears throat> chess goals, maybe? Reach your chess goals. I don't know about that. I didn't know Jeremy had a new book. Uh, oh, Reassess Your Chess. Yes. Oh, that's a great book. It's a classic. Uh, I don't know if there's a part two. He revised it a few years ago. I wonder if that's the uh, book we're talking about, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Are we talking about How to Reassess Your Chess? That's kind of a classic book by Jeremy. Wonderful book. Anybody there to teach us to beginners? We're back. Ah, good. Okay. Let, let me just go ahead and talk about what people have sent uh, here. I got a question. Uh, we never cover historical topics. We got a historical question. So I thought, let's let's do that. It's kind of lengthy, uh, and my answer is kind of lengthy. So I might mix in this with a, with a, some other things. But I'll, well, let's start it out anyway. He says, well, here's a question about Max Oiva. Here's the, that's E... Uh, U V W E, and I was taught to pronounce it Eva, or something along those lines. Um, I don't know the exact pronunciation, uh, but it's E, the the world champion. He was he got the world championship in 1935 against Elyak, and he won a match and then lost a match in 1937. Um, anyway, there's this thing he says. There's this thing or notion or whatever they call it that Eva is the worst world championship in history, not counting Ponomaryov, Kalifman, and Kazimzhanov. And just I should explain to those of you who aren't real chess buffs or haven't followed everything that Ponomaryov, Kalifman, Kazimzhanov, the ones he's not counting, were actually three players who were winners of the so-called FIDE Chess Knockout World Championship, which was um, sort of an elimination kind of world championship that most people don't credit as being in the mainstream of world champions because it's a bit of a random tournament and lower players could play. And in fact, they, they probably weren't the best players in the world at that time when they won it, although they're very strong players. So, so basically he's saying um, that the, the claim is that Eva is the worst world champion of the main stream world champion, champions, and there are 15 of those. Okay, my father always taught me that Eva was kind of lucky and that Eliakin chose him for a match, and that Eliakin was thinking to beat him easily and didn't really prepare, and well, he lost. But Saturday I spoke to an old top Dutch player, he even played against Oeva, and he basically told me that this was bullshit. He told me that Oeva in that time uh, won the most of the big tournaments and that his world championship was totally legit. Uh, and before I get to the rest of his questions, the actual questions, I should say that I think his friend is right, that he's completely legitimate as a world champion. But in fact, it isn't true that he'd won most of the big tournaments. In fact, he'd really not won any super tournament. He'd won some tournaments. In tournament practice, he was not number one in the world at all. Not, not even 
that close. On the other hand, he was very solid, and I think he was approaching his peak performance at about the time he played Elyak, and so there was good timing for the match. And uh, he's a very, very strong player. I would say there were several other players at the time that were still stronger tournament players, Elyak and himself, of course, but also um, uh, players like, well, Capablanca still, Lasker when he played, of course, and a whole bunch of the newer players like Botvinnik had some very impressive wins. Um, uh, Carey's was just coming up, so was uh, uh, Ryshevsky, people like that. But, um, he, but he was you know, an equal at the top, or almost equal at the very top, one of the very, very top players of the world. So he wasn't illegitimate in that sense. On the other hand, he wasn't winning super tournaments, which is relevant to his later question, I think. Um, so he says, no, knowing that, what makes Ivan then the very worst world champion? Mikhail Tal was world champion for a very short time, and the same can be said for Smyslov or maybe Spassky. I confuse these two all the time. So, um, so let me address that real quickly. Uh, that's his first question. Uh, and let me address the, the latter part of it. I think the key here is that comparing players across time is really difficult, really impossible anyway. But um, it's not, and it's not as though Ovid sticks out as some sort of overrated player because he certainly wasn't, and he certainly wasn't lucky. I think he won the match without luck at all. Um, but in terms of overall achievements and successes, he does lag behind the top players, uh, the, the other top official world champions, because partly because the list of chess world champions is kind of unique among sports. It, it's, it lacks any sort of gaps. It, we don't have any fluky champions or even short-term champions. If you look at everyone from Steinitz to Kasparov, they all had stellar tournament results, uh, so, some super tournament victories. You know, Ove, Ove never really had super tournament victories. And these people had multiple ones, almost all of them. Uh, well, except maybe Fisher had very lengthy careers uh, and with very few periods of substandard play where they were getting, you know, coming in last in tournaments or doing very poorly in tournaments. So and just that list real briefly, if you think about it, I mean, Stein is the first guys were, were world champion for long enough and played at a high, high, high world level for so long that they're unquestionably of a higher status than Eva in terms of career achievement. And that's Steinitz, Lasker, Kapobank, and Elyakin. I mean, nobody would really argue that. Bodvinik, I mean, how many years of just being on the top, winning those USSR championships and countless other international tournaments. Uh, Smyslov won many international tournaments. Mikhail Tal was mentioned, and it's true, he was only world champion for a year. He'd be a good candidate. Uh, the problem is that he also won so many tournaments, including some incredibly strong interzonal tournaments, super tournaments. He also had the longest match streak of wins, of games without a draw um, in the 90s, I think. One of them was like 79, and then he did it again and had 90. So he was, he was just winning tournaments uh, regularly and had a very long and productive career. Uh, Petrosian, I guess you could argue, but of course Petrosian won two world championships. Uh, so that's in and of itself uh, a real achievement and um, also had a very long and successful career, although not in terms of tournaments as much as others, more than Ove, but less than the others. Spassky, Fisher, Fisher would be maybe with Tal one of your best bets because he only won it once and he didn't, he didn't win a whole bunch of super tournaments, but still, when you look at his interzonal results, uh, It'd be pretty tough, you know. He just, if it just didn't have the prestigious career uh, of, the, of the, the the results that were just staggeringly good, um, and so he would qual probably qualify as uh, the least outstanding world champion. I hate to say weak, because he's by no means weak in really any sense. Then you have Karpov, one of the greatest tournament record of all time, I think. Kasparov, the most consistent tournament record of all time. Uh, Kramnik, Anand, Carlson. Well, you can see. So. So I guess I have to agree that that Oiva does is he he's a little bit of an outlier uh, in the list, but only because the other ones are so absolutely amazing. I think Oiva's underrated. The the World Championship match with um, yeah he says he wasn't even a professional, uh, but that's not really true. He was professional for quite a few years. I was just reading. Let me tell you, I was reading this book by Munninghoff the uh, this morning. I got addicted to it and didn't really prepare well enough for the show because I couldn't let it put it down again. I'd read some of it before. And um, and I think that it's a book well worth reading. It's really fun. And it really sh it does open your mind to how good uh, Ove was and how exciting those times were. 
Um, let me see if I've got what's the name of the book here. Um, mm, what's wrong with me? Something like Ovo, Ovo World Champion or something like that. It's a new and chess book from, I think, 2001. Oh, Alexander Minenhoff is the author. And I wrote it down, and now I naturally somehow can't find it. Um, hmm. Sorry about that. Anyway, what I was going to say is, Ovis World Championship is against Eliakin. What, what people did is, Eliakin, of course, was a big favorite. One reason, though, he was a big favorite is he was at the peak of his career in the early 30s, having won his, you know, sure, he won his World Championship match before then, but but the early, his tournaments in the early 30s were absolutely amazing, absolutely staggeringly dominant uh, results. So it wasn't so much that people thought Iva was weak. It was more that they thought El Eliakin was just untouchable. Now, that match, people talk about him being drunk and uh, Iva drinking and that sort of thing. It's A lot of it's based on one game where he showed up um, having obviously drunk quite a lot. But uh, there were a lot of myths about that game uh, that apparently didn't happen at all, according to Munninghoff, and all the contemporary accounts don't even have these myths. So the idea somehow was that Eliak and was uh, didn't care about the match and was overconfident and drank too much and was out of shape and didn't really deserve uh, but and, and didn't you know, wasn't trying hard enough for something. But in fact, Eliakin played extremely well. It was a close match, and, and um, he basically, he kind of outplayed Uwe in that match, whereas in the second match, I think it'd be fair to say that even though Uwe got slaughtered, Uwe was better in many, many games. He really outplayed uh, Eliakin and then blundered. And and towards the end of the match, the second match, Uwe, the reason the, the score was so lopsided is because Uwe really collapsed at the very end trying to catch up. He was two points down, and and it's really lost four games after that in a very short time. Um, so even the second match is more competitive than maybe it looked like at first sight, um, or at least most of the match was, was competitive. Um, and, um, but this idea that, uh, that if it didn't deserve to win the first match, I think has been kind of debunked. If you look at the games and, you know, he really fought hard, and, and uh, Eliakin actually did play pretty well. I think Uwe was at his peak then and kind of had a style. It's interesting that Uwe's team and Uwe himself were very overconfident going into the second match themselves. They actually thought that he was probably going to win fairly easily. He thought he had Eliakin's number. He thought he, he had done well in the meantime. He, he played Eliakin a few times and had a plus record in between matches. I think they played four times. Um, and... Um, and he'd always done well against Eliakin before also. So even though his overall record against Eliakin in his career wasn't that great, if you take out the second match where he was a minus six, and then also his their early games when Iva was just a teenager, um, then they had about an even record. So Iva was not scared of Eliakin at all, but he was overconfident. He said he was extremely overconfident. He didn't really even prepare for the second match. Um, that doesn't mean Iva wouldn't have lost anyway. Eliakin was one of the great players of all time. It was a genius and... My guess is he probably would have just won that match, but I think it might have been much closer and certainly is not an indication that somehow the first match was illegitimate. That's that's kind of the... The implication has always been, see, he just slaughtered him once he wasn't drinking or something, and I think that's that's just not uh, a legitimate interpretation. So let me just see what people are saying before I get too, um, too caught up in that. Uh, oh, all kinds of good stuff here. Uh, World Cup Ivanchuk game, yes, uh, I gather he won today, so Geary could be in trouble, which is funny because this this uh, questioner asks about Geary. Okay, so there's the thing about Silman's book. Let me scroll down then. Are there any uh, chess teachers? Okay. Uh, oh, actually, I will be teaching someone not taking lessons. Okay. World Cup Ivanchuk game. Okay, so, and Steinitz. I would say that 12 to $15 for an hour, that would be reasonable for a beginner. It depends on how, how, whether you're a professional teacher, but yeah, that's conceivable. Um, if you're not a professional teacher, that's kind of low, I think. Um, Al Yekin was drunk when he played the match, but he wasn't. That's the point. That's a big myth. Um, it's I'm, I'm almost certainly untrue. Alyakin was a drink. He'd be, he'd drunk for his major tournament victories too. He, he did drink, but he wasn't drunk. Uh, there was one game where, uh, he showed up and he got in a big argument in that game and that made people think he was maybe more drunk than he was, but the argument had to do with delaying the game because he'd had to switch transportation. 
he'd he'd gone back and he, he had to get a train and it was it was a messy situation but um um, so I don't think you can you can account for the result because of his drinking habits. Um, yeah, and Elyakin also played. You know, he he was drinking some for many of yeah for brilliant wins that he had. So uh, not just in that match, but his whole life, or at least as of certainly in the 30s. By the 30s, he's winning wonderful games at his peak strength, and he's he's drinking. So I don't I think that's an overrated factor. It may have had something to do with it. Uh, John Thomas, what defense would you choose against the English today? Well, that's a good question. Um, okay, so C4, uh, what to do against this? What would I do? Well, I've had some practice games recently, uh, and I played two things. And you can, I can play pretty much anything, but but I, um, I, I, I I like playing this just because when I'm white, and I wrote books about you know several books about the English, and then and then another one, sort of uh, a volume on it. Um, I have problems getting advantage against e5, so that's one thing. And um, I, I tried fairly recently playing one of the uh, the classical lines um, that was uh, basically, well, let me see. I actually played knight c3, didn't I? Um, actually, we went, went into one of the classical lines in this kind of position. Um, so I had a game with this, which was a lot of fun. And I had a game, I've played for several years there, and I had really good luck with it. I played the English defense um, and uh, had, uh, even against a couple of grandmasters, had draws, but one's one of them I was much better in. Um, so so that's, uh, that's a possibility, playing this way. The, the main line of the English defense is, is, is this move, but you don't really have to play that. You can go ahead and just play bishop e7 right away to prevent the move e4. And you know after d5 e6, and uh, so I, I've been playing that. I think it's a fun line to play, and it's a little underrated. The main problem with the English defense against, uh, for example, this position, the traditional English defense, is that a lot of people think white's just objectively a little better in this line. I, I know how to play this for black, and I have a student who plays this for black, and somehow the results seem to be okay. But I do have to admit, I, th I think theoretically this position is just a little better for white. I did have. Um, games with the traditional disposition and uh, did fine for black. Um, these are all since I've been playing again. I quit chess for quite a while, quit playing chess, tournament chess for quite a while. Um, what else? Okay, then you can all, but you can play all kinds of things, obviously. This is doing just fine, but as, as going way, way back, there's been a bit of slightly there can be a slightly boring character to that, and a lot of people don't want to play that way. I've also played simply, um, you know, this this kind of thing, and depending on what white does, you know, if white plays there, I might play, uh, I might play this way, for example, and um, and if white plays there, I might, maybe here I might go back and do a symmetrical. Sometimes you can do this kind of thing. Uh, but personally, you asked personally what I play, and I guess I would say both e5 and b6 are my kind of favorite moves against against this. And as I say, the b6 thing is kind of interesting because most people think of this as the English defense, but in fact, I think. This is an interesting, better move order. And I, by the way, these are in my ICC lectures. If you're an ICC member and you go back, you can look at these lectures uh, about this defense, which I have a series on. Um, Eliakin was drunk for a lot of the wins, too. Yes, exactly. Kasparov wrote that in my great predecessors, Karpov would have been Fisher in 75. Oh, I didn't realize he actually said that. What is your opinion on this? Uh, boy, I don't I just have no idea. I think... I think Karpov could have beaten Fisher, and I think that's what people don't realize. It's not as though there would have been some sort of slaughter there at all. I think Karpov would have not gotten the opening disadvantages that Spassky and Larson, for example, got, um, or not as big opening disadvantages, uh, and he would have played much more solidly, and he and and he would have he would have had, um, and he was younger and fresher. You know, the people he was playing were all at the end of their careers uh, in his at, at Fisher's big big stretch of success. Um, in other words, I don't think the results that Fisher had against Taimanoff and Larson and even Spassky and Petrosian necessarily, which are arguably the greatest stretch of results for a short period of anybody in history, uh, mean that he was necessarily in 1975 going to beat Karpov, who beat Spassky by just as much as he did, if not more, uh, in their match. So I'm not and actually Spassky was playing better at that point. I think Spassky was, was more informed by that point. But um, uh, 
So I, I don't have no idea who would have, but I think Karpov would have had a chance for sure. I think Karpov is a better calculator than Fisher for one thing. So it'd be just really a question of who could impose their will on the other guy. I mean, if I think if, if you could just kind of get sort of neutral games, positional games, that Karpov would have had a great chance. I think if you if Fisher Fisher had a magic about his openings, he really had a way of getting people in openings they didn't want to be in. And uh, if he could have dominated the openings the way he did against really everybody at that time period, it'd be different. It's just that I'm not sure if Karpov would have like kind of confronted Fisher in that realm at all. I think he might have just played fairly safe positional things that he knew extremely well. And uh, and if he had gotten tiny disadvantages, they would have been so tiny that that they wouldn't have uh, maybe made very much difference. So I just wouldn't want to make that prediction. But I, I think at least it's not an outrageous claim. I think Kasparov has a has a good point about um, the possibility. I don't. I think Fisher wouldn't have been as comfortable playing somebody young with a lot of energy. But on the other hand, of course, Fisher had much more experience and was at his peak in at least in '72. So you know, a peak Fisher, you know, who knows? He, he might have won easily. You never know. I, I think it's also possible that Karpov would have played so well that he would have gotten a lead and Fisher would have dropped it out or something. So who knows? World Cup results showing in proper format to qualify for a match against the world champion. I agree. Carlson didn't qualify by himself. Out early more games with fewer competitors. I think there should be only one slot in the World Cup. or And the only reason there should even be one is because it attracts chess attention and money not because the person really deserves to be there. I think that the um, having tournaments, qualifying tournaments, is a much better system. This Grand Prix really is a pretty darn good thing. Players really earn their way in, and they have to play all their peers. You know, in the World Cup, you may even not have to play anybody that good if you get lucky with the pairings, uh, you know, with some lucky results. Um, so I, I don't like the World Cup as a qualifier, and if you're going to have it, at least just have it be one slot. Two slots is a tremendous amount because you've got a couple already devoted. You've got a couple guys, you know, that have already qualified for other reasons, and you have rating qualification. And it just seems to me, um, yeah. I, so I, I agree. I don't like it, like it at all as a qualifier. But it was not even. Whoops. Oh, what does it say? Sorry. Um, hmm. Scrolling. Here we go. Another quote. Oh, got all kinds of things here. I wish I, I don't understand why. Uh, well, uh, in 75, Korsner was a better endgame player than Karpov. So was Fisher, and he didn't have emotional, Karsner has emotional problems. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about that. I, I'm not sure. Fisher was rated much higher than Karpov then, so I don't know why he wouldn't be the favorite. Well, Spassky you know, had beaten Karpov every time they played, at knee before they played. I, I don't think that means anything. And I don't think, rate, when you talk about great players like that, I don't think rating means much. And of course, Karpov was on his way up. So his rating wasn't, well, I, I just, I, I don't see that being super relevant. But, you know, it's a good point. Um, the move was for John and not prepare, preparing. What do you recommend versus the Baltic? How dare he not prepare? Okay, here's a quote. But Salah Floor, who was helping Ovid during the match, thought overconfidence was more of a problem than alcohol for Elyakin in the match. And Elyakin himself said, yes, he was overconfident. He thought he would win easily. I agree. And Ovid was overconfident in the return match. Even his helpers were overconfident. They all thought he basically had Elyakin's number. Elyakin hadn't done that great in between matches they played. And Ovid had done fine. So it's kind of interesting. Many world champions, uh, Karpov and Kasparov, analyzed the match for their own benefit and concluded that Ovid deserved to win. The standard play was worthy of a world championship. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that's true. I agree with that. Frozen again. Oh, no. Is that still true, folks? So just continue. Chuck, you've had a drink-related chess loss. Okay, so we'll do... Um... Oh, the moves can be seen. Oh, that's great. Okay. Okay. Um... Picture is frozen on John's best side. <laughs> oh, I don't have a best side. The C4, B6 English defense against the English opening is ironic. That seems interesting. Yeah, I've played against that. I've played against all this stuff. Um, he's saying that this line with E4 and 92. Yeah, I think um, this is Avruk recommends this, right, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think this is an interesting answer. There's a lot of answers to this one. You can play Sicilian-ish stuff, too. 
Uh, one, this is an interesting answer. It's an answer I never make this kind of move. I don't like to block my F pawn, but it is interesting that this variation, not that he would necessarily push, but if he does, this bishop is, is strong enough that because it's unobstructive that it tends to make up for white space and development advantage. So knight f6 is definitely a legitimate answer. I, I like that. I, uh, and how would I play this white? Oh, well, let me think. Um, okay, what's the main line here? I think the main line is something like just here. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then black can play a, um, a Sicilian-like structure like that. And white can play the fianchetto. And that's probably what I would do as white. I would just fianchetto, play normally. So for example, something like this could happen. Uh, here, d6 or bishop uh, e7. Maybe you wait with d6, because I don't think e5 is really a threat. I mean, it's, I don't think it's a problem. The knight just goes to g4 or e8. So something like this could happen. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there, partly because we're so far behind today. The board works. Uh, if you like playing the Chagorn as black against the Queen's Gambit, what should you do against knight f3? I'm not sure about knight c6 due to g3. Excellent question. Super question. Yeah, I wrote a book about the Chagorn years ago, and I helped the person who wrote the, uh, the main book about the Chagorn. This is the Chagorn defense of the Queen's Gambit um, <clears throat> and um, this knight c6 move. And... Uh, the book by Valerie Bronsnick is the best book by far. Uh, there's an English edition, second edition that's in English that is worth getting. Uh, the question is, oh yeah, and then this is every Chagorin defense player's problem, is what do you do against this? Because they want to play here, but they know white probably won't cooperate and play that move, which would transpose into a normal Chagorin. Nevertheless, Bronsnick book, book and other books do say, well, you can play this way. This is an odd position because the Verisoft is not particularly impressive for white here, for example, and yet and yet white's a full tempo up on what black's doing in um, in this position. For example, yeah, whatever white does, black wants to play here now. But that's chess. There's a lot of times when you have that extra information about what your opponent's doing, it's okay to be a, a half tempo down in, an, in the opening. So you can definitely play this way. There's many people who have played this way. Is white can be a little better? Probably. The two main moves that bother me are bishop f4 and and what you say, g3. Those are the two moves that are most worrisome. On the other hand, a lot of players have played this as black. They just play here. Um, you can look this up in various books and then here. And, and a lot of times they'll go queenside and try to, try to attack. Uh, the other way you can do it is just play conservatively, play this kind of move and just get your pieces out. And, um, you know, is white better? I'm not sure. I... I I suspect he's very, very slightly better if he plays perfectly, but but it's just an opening. So you can go ahead and play your knight c6 move and hope that he plays c4 and you get in a regular Chagorin. If you don't want to do that, well, there's plenty of things you can do, of course. You can just imitate for one move and then decide what you're doing. Play a Slav defense, play a Queen's Gambit declined, play a Queen's Gambit accepted. Um, what else? Uh, you can play... What can you play here? You can play a semi-Slavish kind of thing if he plays there, for example. You can play, you have to play against the Catalan in these cases, of course. Uh, you can play, uh, Bishop F5 has been played. I'm not that thrilled. That's a Baltic, by the way. It's not a bad Baltic, not a bad version of the Baltic, because he hasn't, he, at least you've cut out the options of an early Queen B3, because C4 hasn't been played yet. That would be called the Baltic. You could do that. Um, so all these things are possible. I, I would say, and Bishop before G4 immediately is possible, but I don't like that at all. I think this position favors white no matter what black does. White's idea is to play C4 and Queen B3. So I wouldn't play Bishop G4 immediately. I would play Knight C6 first and then Bishop G4, in spite of the fact that these positions, well, if you like them, if you can stand, you just have to study them and look at them a little bit. Oh, and you can play Bishop F5 now too, although I still prefer Bishop G4. Okay, what's next? Is the stream frozen again? Uh, Karpov was a better version of Petrosian in 1975. <laughs> okay. Um, that's funny, my screen isn't frozen. Karpov was on his way up at the time, but he didn't get near 2780. Well, you know, that he the minute he became world champion, he, he started playing super tournaments and he won them all. So I don't think, uh, I don't think the rating thing makes any difference really, uh, just my opinion. Um, now that's an answer from some time ago. So that worries me. That makes me think I've, um, I've skipped some things, or or that my own stream has been frozen. So that's not good. Can someone still tell me if I'm still on? Give me a message if I'm still 
if I'm still getting through, even if it's just the audio, we can talk about OIVA and other things. Um, yeah, if someone could say something there. <laughs> I'm reading through the comments, some funny comments here. <laughs> Okay, we're still talking about teaching. I think I've actually caught up with the actual questions here, at least the ones that I got. You guys are probably saying other things, and and my chat has doesn't go any further. Um, hi, Sita. Probably Kirk. But cell floor help. Okay, so the cell floor quotes. I'm just rolling through this chat again to see what I've missed. Um, yeah. Uh, Queen's Gambit. Okay, here we go. If you like playing the drawing against the black, what should you do? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I already got that. Yeah, my, my chat hasn't gotten beyond... Um, Ivanchuk won today in the Petrov against Geary. That's right. He beat Geary. Be great. I'd, I'd like to see Ivanchuk do well. I think it'd be really fun for him to do well. Uh, Geary was asked about... Oh, maybe we'll continue this question about Oiva because the same... Uh, listener asked about Gary, Gary and Timon, because he's Dutch. What's your opinion of Marin's series? Personally, I prefer Knight C3 to his G3. I think Knight C3 is far more interesting than G3. G3 is much easier to learn. Um, Marin plays pretty much G3 against everything on the second move, no matter what Black does. And um, I think I've mentioned before on this uh, on these broadcasts that I think Marin is one of the best authors around. You, you almost can't go wrong with buying his books. That, but, but that for some reason his English opening series, every time I use it with my students, we find out we can't play the lines he recommends or we're not. Um, he's incredibly optimistic for White. He always gives little advantages, even when I think he stands worse. Uh, I, it's a very strange book. It's, Marin, Marin is just one of the best authors we have. Please read his books. Don't listen. Don't don't be discouraged by what I'm going to say. But but the English opening books I, have been very disappointing for me. It's a four volume series. It's very thorough. It's neat. He covers a lot of subjects that aren't covered anywhere else, but um, I just think they're very inaccurate. The assessments, put on the chat whether you can actually hear me, because I my understanding is that last time I went down, it was, um, it was still working. Here's a question. Someone, someone just sort of confirmed that. If you like playing the Budapest as black, um, three volumes, yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you, that means you guys are hearing me. If you like playing the Budapest as black, what do you do against two knight f3? Same question, same kind of question as we just got. Very good, good question too, by the way. Sure, that's a good point. If you're if you're somebody who really is excited about this position, it's very much like the Chagorin, right? Here you are with a anti queen's gambit or queen pawn opening system, and maybe you play knight here, knight e4, and then the guy plays knight f3, and you have to learn a whole nother system, and so that's that's a real problem. And this time you can't even do what you did with the Chagorin. You can't play e5 at all. At least with the Chagorin, as I say, this is probably a little bit underrated for black playing this way. It's kind of anti-positional because it blocks off the C-pawn. Uh, and as I say, in the reverse position, black's happy to have white play knight C3. But uh, somehow, this there you can look at the books. There's quite a, way, quite a few ways of playing this and having some fun with it. Whereas in the Budapest, you've really been stopped, right? After the two knight F3 move. Uh, you're just not going to get this gambit in. So you need another system. And as I say, you can play there. We just talked about that. And play a Slav defense or Queen's Gambit declined or Queen's Gambit accepted. Um, or you can play um, anything else here. You can switch to a King's Indian. You can switch to a Nimzu Indian. If you're a Budapest Gambit player, stylistically... Wow. Stylistically, I suppose you might be more of a King's Indian kind of player because you like activity, but I, I actually don't even know. Um, you can play moves like this, but this is a, a difficult position to play because you can't even force a Benoni because he can, he can play this move instead of C4. So I wouldn't really recommend this line, although you can just go like this and go like this. It's not very Budapest-like, though, at all. Um, wow. You, you can certainly play here and play a Nimzo Indian or a Queen's Indian or a Queen's Gambit declined or whatever. Um, but there's really no good answer to that because I don't know what you like playing quite well, this this A6 move. Um, in light of all kinds of attempts by White. If you look at Esserman's book, he try he suggests something to at least try as White, but I'm, it's not 
horrendously convincing. So that's a good way to do it, but you have to learn a bunch of theory for that one. It's a little bit risky. Uh, if you don't want to learn that much theory, I keep mentioning this line that Eric Schiller and I have been recommending for 30 years that I think is a lot of fun, which is putting the bishop here before you even bring the knights out. And you can go back and look at earlier lecture series to talk about that, um, or to ask about that. But basically the point is you're just going to, a lot of times you're going to play knight here, knight here, here, you're pawn up, and you're just going to play extremely solidly. And the reason for playing this this early is because uh, because you can get castled quickly and just play solidly. The negative is it looks like black and white can immediately run his pieces into the center, but it turns out black can play this. Actually, there's other moves too, and and stand quite reasonably. So um, so you know look into that system possibly. It's hardly in the books. That's why I like it. There's very little about it. It's in our Taming the Wild Chess Openings book. Um, Okay, is 2b5 playable after d4? Yes, in fact, it has been played a fair amount. Is, it, is this the Romanesian they call this? Um, yeah, now he's talking about playing, instead of, for example, b6, where he might play c4, um, or e6, or anything where he might play c4, um, he's talking about black playing b5 to stop this move and also get Fianchetto at the same time. So as opposed to b6, which lets white have more space. So, uh, and yes, that's definitely a playable move. I think Romanesian started playing this some years ago. Um, is it equal? Probably not. Um, it's better after g3. For example, if you have, let me see, a position like this. Now this move is particularly useful, partly because the bishop isn't already aiming. The bishop's going to be going this way, so there's going to be less pressure on the queen side. That's the more popular b5. You'll see this played quite a bit. This b5 isn't played as much. I think one problem with this b5 is this move a4. And if you play b4, then um, there's a, it's just a little bit of looseness on the queen side, I think. And uh, don't quote me on that, but I think that might be one of the main problems. Um, and also that if you if you defend here or something, um, well, you can't play a6 because of um, a takes b. But the bishop's still heading towards this side of the board, whereas after g3, b5, um, sorry, let me think what I'm doing here. Like after g3, b5, then you don't have to any longer worry about the bishop exerting pressure here because you're not going to play e3 and g3 without creating a lot of weaknesses. Um, so, so yes, it's legitimate, but it's not. It's not the main. It's playable, but not uh, the real popular. Lucky is in the middle. Oh boy, stream getting choppy. Uh, some unpleasant vowel. <laughs> okay, how about? Smith Moore exchanging d4, then e6. Okay, let's look at this. Instead of and play a French like with d5 coming. Yeah, I'm not particularly fond of that, and I'll tell you why. Here's what he's saying. Good suggestion, though. Good idea. He's saying just to play it safe. Let's not let's not get greedy. Let's not take a pawn. Let's play this move e6, and then if he takes, we'll play sort of a French defense. And the only problem with that is that this it's it's early to have taken here. That's usually a bad sign. Usually black in the French defense it doesn't want to play, doesn't want to take too early. For example, in the advanced variation, or actually most other variations, but in this kind of variation, he wants to let that sit there for a while so that the knight can't go to c3. So that's why you won't see c takes d early in most variations. So by doing this, you've expo you've already committed to c3. So that's a small point, but it might end up being significant. Let's see if we can make sense out of that. Okay, so you're saying play e6. White's going to take that back. Even the advanced the advanced variation is better for white if those pieces are exchanged off. Um, notice there's no nothing like this anymore. And let's see if we can kind of prove that. Um, let's just see something. Let's say you try to maybe transpose into something like this. I think maybe knight c3 might be more effective than usual. Is that true? Yeah, I think it probably is. Because normally you're stuck with, for example, here you could play knight h6 normally, but um, here with this knight already out, it's not so effective. Let me show you that. In the advanced French, for example, um, you might get something like this, 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 here, white defends this, black attacks the center. Uh, and white makes a move, but it, it's going to be some kind of slow move. If he plays there, he's exposing the center. And if he plays there, it's a little slow. And black can make a move like this. And even if white 
takes that, it turns out that um, that having the pawn here means the knight can't get out really quickly and exploit the position. Uh, whereas in this position, black wouldn't take first because white can make a very useful move here. And this move, I think, becomes kind of rather suspicious because of this capture. Because white likes having this aggressive position for the uh, for the knight, and and that probably makes up for. I think I'd just rather be white here. I think that's a reasonable explanation of what why you wouldn't want to do that. It's also true that the main lines aren't as as good for white for um, black either here. <clears throat> Even if black just makes a normal move here like this or something, I think. Let me see. No, that's okay. That position's probably okay. Let me see if white. No, I think the main problem would be would be taking this now. Okay, anyway, that's kind of a real quick reason you might not want to do that. It seems to me if they play the more, you should learn some line where you just take the pawn, because black is better, probably. Uh, at least in my opinion, he's probably already better. So as long as he's get, the white's giving you an advantage, maybe you should just take it. I mean, if you really, really have to save time, you should play one of the other type exchange for, uh, uh, declined variations like this. If you're a Sicilian player, you probably know either this position anyway, or you know um, this position anyway. I hope you all can see this, by the way. I can, so I suppose you guys can. So this is um, a typical um, Alpin Sicilian. And you probably know one of those two positions anyway. So if you're just trying to save time, I would decline that way. I wouldn't decline with e6. Um, so, but, but the best thing of all to do is just accept it and find some system where white ends up with not quite enough for his pawn. Stream getting choppy. <laughs> the tubes. <laughs> Yeah, the internet is broken. Did anybody ever see the IT crowd where Jen breaks the internet? Absolute classic. British comedy. IT crowd. IT for um, for the IT department. Um, internet technology. Uh, crowd. C-R-O-W-T. IT crowd. I think it's on Netflix. I think you can get it on Netflix. Tremendous series. Board is okay, but your webcam's frozen. Yeah, maybe just it's a webcam issue. That was the the <clears throat> that was probably the driver that the Windows warned me about was the webcam driver. <clears throat> okay, what else have we got? Is there an easy way to play against B3 and B4? Preferably getting similar positions, similar kind of positions for black. Oh, uh, let me let me think about that. <clears throat> Oh, I wanted to get back to, let me show you, before I get, get to that, uh, this is without E5. Steiner, hi. Wow. Nice to have you back. I'm curious if the general plan for the trush, semi trush is to strictly solidify our queenside. Okay. So I will go, we will go back to that. Let me in the meantime show you this game between um, Oiva and Eljekin to in honor of, the, of this question, and maybe I'll even get to more of the question. This is the so-called Pearl of Zanzivort game that we grew up with, but I bet most of you have never seen. Otherwise, I wouldn't show it to you. Um, <clears throat> Oiva is white. It's the um, 15th, what is it? It's the 26th game. Uh, so uh, I can place a Dutch defense <clears throat> and comes back, and he had sort of invented this system, actually, for this match. Um, Oh, yeah, I can had. So anyway, both sides are just developing. I'm not going to do opening theory here. Uh, Black usually plays d5 instead of knight e4, but but it is probably playable, still playable to play this way. Um, okay, and then this knight e5, nice move. Knight c3. Oh, and this is a nice move for Black because if White takes this, there's this check, and then there's knight takes, and then this other knight comes out. And if white ends up taking there, he's lost all his light squares around the king. I'll let you look at that on your own later. So white really can't take um, uh, white really can't take the bishop on b7, or he can, but it's it's only equal at best. Okay, so there's some simplification taking place here, and both sides play very well here. I mean, this is that well, the whole match was extremely well played, by the way, as I think someone pointed out there. Um, that's an odd move, king h1. I'm not so sure about that one. But anyway, um, the, the key idea usually in these positions, by the way, since white has space, is to break with f4. And then and then white has to make, a, black has to make some kind of decision. If he takes it or if he advances it, there's lo this the pressure along the long diagonal is increased. 
And uh, so that would be the theme that White's looking for, sometimes prefaced with E3. Sometimes even there's an E4 followed by an F4. So King H1 is a little strange, but anyway. So black counterattacks which seems like a good idea. White's now threatening something like um, <clears throat> C5, followed by something with a, well, maybe knight takes E5 and D6 check, winning that bishop. So black gets out of the way. That King H8 does make sense. And there's that F4 move. I'm just not sure why he waited on with it, but it's quite it's conceivable. Okay, um, knight before, excellent move. Looking at those light squares, black decides he has to close it up, and now white has the better bishop. That's a worse bishop, but black's probably going to oppose those bishops at some point. Okay, black develops. White's got more space. Now he's kind of got some threats there, and that's, that's where the game gets interesting. Black <clears throat> opposes the bishops, and white sacrifices a piece. And this turns out to lead to some very, very beautiful variations, whether it's for sure an advantage or not is not totally clear, but it's um, a very good thing. Okay, he gets a second pawn for his piece, and now he gets a third one. So you might argue it's not much of a sacrifice. But black's very active, and this king is a little bit exposed. So maybe maybe it is a, it's a sacrifice of sorts. Um, but white's idea is just advancing these pawns. It's going to make up for everything. So black does a great thing, just breaks up. Actually, they, this move was criticized, but I kind of like it. It's breaking up lines towards the king. Uh, white advances, and black covers that g1 square, so he's going to have some control of the g file. He's trying to get near the king. The king's a little bit exposed. It'd be nice to have a queen here, for example, or a knight on one of these kinds of squares. So he's going to filter over towards the king's side. But in the meantime, white's got two passed pawns in the center, and they're quite advanced. And in fact, he should have made an extra move here probably now and just advanced those pawns more slowly, but instead he played that immediately. And it just gets very complicated. I'm not going to make much, make much, too much of these games. The problem now, of course, is that if, if uh, white takes that, there's this, which he may have missed, and there are too many threats. This is threatened. There's mates threatened. Uh, things are not working out. So white naturally doesn't do that. White plays there. Um, the better move, according to Oiva, was to play over here first to get the queen so the queen's not blocked off, and then you can keep advancing your pawns. Uh, but he played here, black played up, threatening checkmate, and white gave back a rook, which is fine because that bishop was the best piece on the board for black, so getting rid of that is interesting. However, now white really is materially down. In fact, he's a full rook down for three pawns, right? <clears throat> so black moves over, white plays knight g5. I think that's probably an excellent move. Uh, this was given question mark all over the place, this queen f6 move, but in fact it's just fine. But that move was also, both moves actually end up being equal with perfect play. What does white have? White's got a big attack going with knight here, knight here, and he has these pawns advancing in the center. His queen's going to be a powerful piece. What does black have? Well, black has material, and white's king is still a little bit exposed. So anyway, he plays queen f6, that's question marked everywhere. It was interesting to go over this game on the computer because I'm not sure if Kasparov did in his book, but anyway, I don't see any notes by anybody uh, on this game since the computer era. And so really all the notes from the great players of the past seem to be <laughs> quite wrong, and not surprisingly so because they're so it's such a complicated position. Um, here's a pretty variation, though, that everybody did seem to notice, which is check... Here, or not everybody, Oiva, Oiva gave this line, actually. Queen check, rook here, and now this very nice move, knight up, attacking the rook. Knight takes is forced. Uh, pawn takes, queen back, d6, uh, queen b7, check. Black's still a, a, a piece up, and d6 is a nice move because of this move, queen d5. And the point is, is that even a rook down... Uh, white is going to be actually winning this position, believe it or not, because the pawns are so strong. And I guess I won't go much further than that, but that, this very nice little, uh, a very nice uh, variation. Because white's a full rook down, would, but would win this. And this was played in the World Championship. It, had, it takes a lot of nerve to play a rook down in the World Championship. So h6 was not good. Eliakin played here. Um, the best move, and everybody thought black was lost here. For, you, for you know, 40 or 50 or 60 years, people say black was lost. But the computer points out that that move is actually perfectly okay and roughly equal. But um, how are we going to know these things w without a computer, basically?
This way he gets the pawn back, so it seems more logical, but in fact, white gets in faster. White's got the move queen e5 and knight e6. Queen e5 is still a theme. In fact, that's what he plays now. Even here, black still had a chance, but we, I won't go into that. Black still had a chance here, but now this knight and these pawns are very, very strong, and black wasn't able to defend. Um, now here, white should play this move rook g5, supposedly. But even then, it wasn't... Actually, even now, black's still sort of in this game, oddly enough. And I think h6 is really the fatal mistake. He needed to play rook takes e6 and run the king over. And I maybe white's better, but I'm not sure if white's for sure winning. Now that there's no counter-exchange sacrifices, the pawns are just too strong. <clears throat> so you can imagine that this is just not working. And... And that was the end of the game because White's picking up a, a whole rook this time. Okay, and the, maybe more than a rook actually. <laughs> okay, so um, so I just thought I'd show everybody that to show a game. I thought that would, people might enjoy that. Now let me see. It says, is there an easy way to play against b3 and b4? Um, <clears throat> let me just scroll down too. And then there's another thing about the uh, another thing about. The Ruy Lopez. Oh, there's a bunch of questions here, it looks like. Okay. Yeah, my own... It's funny that it's not just the webcam with me. It's my my chat goes in fits and starts. Oh, here we go. Benko Gambit is black. Oh, we're getting a lot of good questions. Good. So let me try and ask this B, B3, B4 question first. I'm not sure if I'm going to have a great answer. You want something that's both B3 and B4 that doesn't involve E5. <clears throat> one, one, one problem already with that to me is that you can play E5 so strategically or tactically that it's a good... No matter what style you want, you, you, you really should be able to play uh, e5. Now, against b3, you could play a Sicilian-like structure, but you can't do that. Well, probably don't want to do that against b4. <clears throat> so um, so what's something you can play against both of them? Oh, I know what you can play against both of them. You can play b6. So that's not a bad answer. And, you know, force white to show what he's doing and then adjust accordingly. Um, you can do the same thing against b4. You just play b6. That's one idea. What else can you play against both b4 and b6? You can set up with e6. Okay, here's something you can do against both of them. You can set up with knight f6 and g6, because bishop takes f6 is not really a threat. So against both b4 and b3, that's a reasonable setup. This is really nothing to be afraid of, this line. This just doesn't really do that much. It's actually fine for white's exposing himself as much as black is. Um, so, so that would be an answer to that and you can it's even better against b4 i think because b4 after all exposes the uh exposes the bishop uh you can answer separately b4 and b before b6 with separate answers we used to like to play this move just for fun this idea of playing queen b up here for example this kind of position and then white would often make this and if black tried to attack this pinned pawn here white would sometimes make this clever little move c5 because if you take that you lose your rook in the corner that way but black doesn't have to play that way that's that was always a reasonable system d6 is good against anything d5 is good against any of these moves obviously right there's nothing wrong with this so it's a kind of a funny question i'd have to have more of a um and you can always just set up with an absolute standard queen's gambit decline setup or bring your bishop out like that nothing wrong with that so i guess the question is a little too broad there's you can do almost anything against either b3 or b4 because neither of them are very um aggressive moves they aren't bad moves but they don't do that much Okay, I'm curious if the Tarash or semi Tarash is strictly to solidify the king's side and play on the queen side. Uh, no, not at all. No, whoa, that's strange. Um, okay, so here's the Tarash or semi Tarash. Let's look at uh, let's look at some of those. This is the Tarash defense, and the question is: Is the general plan? Solidify the queen, king side and play on the queen side. No, I would say black tends to play in the center and often on the king side in the trash. Or maybe you're talking about white. Or maybe you're talking about a particular line. I think we need to look at a particular line. Maybe you're talking about the main line or something, the, the old main line. Now, if black's playing the C4 lines, for example, um, you know these, these, these things where you play for the move C4, then you're probably playing on the queen side. If black plays this way, he's probably playing mainly in the center. And maybe on the king side to some extent. You can get king side attacks sometimes in the Tarash. 
but you're playing for activity in the center more than anything else. What's White doing? Well, White's playing wherever the wherever he's allowed to. Um, a lot of times he's playing in the center too. Knight e5s and e4s, things like that. Um, if he plays a d takes c5 line, then sometimes he's playing. Uh, maybe there he would play more on the queen side. Let's think about that. You know, like this kind of thing. Remember, these are these are really old lines. These ideas when you play here, for example, that kind of thing. Um, and then you play knight d5 and knight d2. In these lines, you probably play on the queen side. You play like rook c1. And, but it's an awfully general question. There's there's hundreds of variations of the Tarash, unfortunately, for both black and white. So we'd have to kind of pick a variation and then decide whether you're playing on the queen side or the king side. Right now, I think it's fair to say all you're doing is playing in the center. That's it. And same thing with the semi Tarash, by the way, um, where, where when you get a position like this, here now here a lot of times you end up playing on the queen side i think that's fair to say because you get these standard isolated pawn for black you end up playing on the queen side a lot because you get a lot of these standard positions where black plays a move like uh rook plays rook c8 and uh, let's just, let's just play some moves here just some simple moves and it kind of depends what you're you can play a6 now or b6 for for example just let's say white plays um here or something and Maybe we'll get one of these kinds of positions. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's, let's, let's talk about some position where you play here. That might be an idea. So there's these kind of things where black plays for b5, knight a5, b5, bishop b7, and a rook on c8. Well, those are queen side plans. That's pressure on the queen side and maybe to some extent in the center. Uh, so it's not the semi tarash you're not that often going to be playing in the... Um, in the on the king side, you're probably going to be playing on the queen side. The tarash you can play all over the board. Uh, this kind of semi tarash. Um, let's look at this kind of one uh, thing where we get. Um, what am I doing? Uh, let me do where, where e4 where e4 happens, for example. This kind of semi tarash. Here, black almost always plays on the queen side, and white plays on the um, center. Plays in the center and plays in the. Let me let me make some of these moves. Maybe 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 for example this line. Sorry, I'm getting going too fast here. Um, this kind of line here, Black will play on the queen side with moves like knight a5, b5, maybe bishop d7, maybe bishop b7, rook c8, and White will tend to play in the center and maybe on the king side, wandering over to attack on the king side. So, but that's only particular variations. So it's you can't talk too generally. Versus a Dutch player. If you like playing the Banco Gambit as black, what should you do against knight f3? That's a tough question. I might want to. I might want to just copy that for next week because I just noticed how late it's getting. And I will answer that question next week. What's the other one? I'll also answer this one. What do you think about the carries variation of the main line of the Ray Lopez? I always had a soft spot for the carries variation. I think it's been revived just slightly. It's been. Um, it's been criticized. Uh, I mean, it's criticized. It's been considered slightly better for white for quite a while, but then maybe recently I saw some game with it. What else have we got here? A bunch of comments. Oh, that's, these are old questions, apparently. Taking out the tarish. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, I think we've gotten to the end here. It's really, really late. And I'm sorry about the usual technical difficulties. It's a, it was a new one this time. It was something to do with the um, the drivers for Windows this time. But um, at least you got to see quite a few things. Apparently that game I showed came through, it looks like. And uh, next week I'll cover the last questions that people asked and maybe things that were earlier that I missed. And we will uh, send me your questions. Don't forget that. Last thing I'm going to say, please send me your questions. Ask I am Watson at chessclub.com, A S K I M W A T S O N at chessclub.com. And please tune in next week and ask questions on the chat. And you can also, uh, at any time you want to, you can message me on ICC. My handle there is John L. Watson, J O H N L W A T S O N. And remember that when you send things by the email, the Ask I Am Watson email, you can wait. There's a wait. Uh, you can send me um, opinions, too, and recommendations. You don't have to. Soft spot for the carries. Soft spot meaning that I uh, like it. I like the idea of uh, really, really uh, fortifying the E5 square. We'll look at it next week. I promise we'll look at it next week. Uh, and uh, in other words, I like the idea of playing knight d7 and being just very solid and playing bishop f6 a lot of times and, and not letting, not being forced to take on d4. I think it's a fun, a fun idea. But... 
even though I have a soft spot for it, I realize it's kind of a backward idea and that you're likely to have some small disadvantage. That's my guess, if White plays well, if White knows what he's doing. But it might be fun to play. A lot of these Rui Lopez positions are fun to play. And I, I especially like it when you keep a lot of pieces on the board. And the carries variation does keep a lot of pieces on the board. All right, everybody, thank you very much. And I'll see you next week.